Hi, everybody. I'm Joan Raymond, and this is A Heart for Writing. Have you ever wondered how to write memoir, or maybe what part of your story to tell? Well, my upcoming guest will answer those questions and many more on today's episode. My special guest today is Annis Cassells. She's a writer, life coach, and a teacher who divides her time between California and Oregon. She facilitates memoir writing classes for senior adults and has conducted writing workshops through Dignity Hospital's Art for Healing program since its inception. Annis claimed her voice as a poet in 2015 and has had poems published in print and online journals. In 2019, she published her first collection, You Can't Have It All, Poems. And she also contributed several poems to the 2020 social justice anthology, Enough, Say Their Names, Messages from Ground Zero to the World. And I would like to bring Annis into the studio. Hi, Annis. Hey, Joan. Good to see you. It's good to see you, too. Since you've been in Oregon, I haven't seen you. I well. know. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Annis and I have been friends for, what, at least 10 years? At least. Yeah, we met through Writers of Kern, which a lot of my guests, I have I have formed friendships in Writers of Kern. And um, she's she's one of my best friends, so I have to say she's an amazing lady. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto, my darling. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. So before we talk about memoir, I mean, this is that's what we're really going to talk about a lot. I do want to ask you a couple questions. When did you realize you had a passion, you had a heart for writing? Oh, probably as a kid. Uh, I wrote stories. I wrote in a daily journal or as we called it that in those days, a diary, you know, right. with a little lock and funky <laughs> key. And um, and I also worked on the high school newspaper. And so uh, and loved my English classes. So I was I was writing from from very young. Yeah, it's one of those weird ones, too, that enjoyed English. <laughs> <laughs> um so authors and poets, which ones did you read? Which ones did you look to for inspiration? Well, um, one, of course, is Alice Walker. She is such a fabulous writer. And uh, her her prose, her memoir, and her poetry is all really wonderful. The poet that's inspired me the most lately is Ellen Bass. And I've taken a number of her six-week workshops and also was lucky enough to do a, an in-person retreat to her back in the day wow. uh, in Canada, which was really wonderful. Other memoir people, though, are uh, Natalie Goldberg, which, you know, I really yes. want to recommend her book called um, Old Friend from Far Away. It's a practice in memoir writing. And I have a couple, three books that um, I want to recommend to people today. So I'll be talking about those uh, unless you want me to mention them right now. Joan. Actually, why don't you mention them? Because I can put links in the description to them after. Okay. Um, you know, so go ahead and just tell me which books. Okay. Uh, another one is Mary Carr's book. Let me, let me see. Um, and yes, I'll look up links and put them, you know, so you can okay. find these. Okay. Mary Carr. And Mary Carr is one and Judith Barrington is another. Okay. I think Mary Carr's is the art of memoir. Okay. And I can't remember the exact one of Judith Barrington's, but she's really good. And after reading her book, I was able to use some of her tips in the classes that I taught. That's awesome. So why don't you send me the, the um, exact information and then I can definitely have links to the right books. I'll be doing that. We'll, okay. We'll do that. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been published since 2015 and you had memoir pieces in Chicken Soup for the Soul, Inspiration for the Young at Heart. And in Persimmetry, which is an online journal, how did it feel to get published in those? Oh, it was amazing. It was really amazing. You know, thousands of people submit to uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. So to get picked for that is just 101 stories and probably five to 10,000 people mm -hmm. submit a story. But this was inspiration for the young at heart. So they were looking to older people to, you know, relate a story that was quote, inspirational or shows that you weren't, you know, ready for for the old folks home. <laughs> so I submitted a story about um, riding motorcycles. And so uh, I, when I got the word from them that I had been, my piece had been accepted, I was in Hawaii. 
wow. I was sitting out by the pool at my sister-in-law's place and uh, working on my computer for some reason or other. And the email came in and I just whooped out and, you know, <laughs> gathered up my stuff and ran in to tell everyone. It was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, I, I personally know this, but just tell everybody why you wrote about motorcycles. Because I've been riding motors. I had been riding motorcycles since just before I turned 50 years old. Um, I had a friend who said, let's do something exciting. Let's 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 ride. Let's get scooters. And then it turned into motorcycles. And so um, love of motorcycles and the, the people who ride motorcycles. I was in a club called Wow. Uh, Women on Wheels, and uh, we rode, we, the the club met at different places every summer around the country. And so your, your vacation was around that, uh, they call it the, the ride-in. So it's around the ride-in. And I, so I've ridden my motorcycle across the United States five or six times, sometimes by myself, sometimes with other people, and uh, just really it, uh, riding a motorcycle and in control of your own bike gives you a lot of confidence and and a, a lot of, uh, uh, I say, cash value. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, people look at you and they see you differently. <laughs> well, and, and your dear motorcycle was named? Big Red. Big Red, yeah. Big Red. I it wish I would have had a picture of her. It was a big red, candy apple red uh, Honda Goldwing. And so I say Honda Goldwing because people always assume if you had a motorcycle, it's a Harley. But no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's talk about memoir because, you know, the question was how to write it and what part of your story to tell. So is memoir your whole life story? No, definitely not. Whole life story is is an autobiography. Okay, so you know I was born, you know I did this, I did this, or this, and now it's yesterday. You know, to, up till yeah. yesterday, possibly. But um, memoir, you take a slice of your life that you want to uh, highlight and bring forth, and you decide on that, and then your stories relate to that. And so uh, right now I've got a series of stories that I'm um, revising and, and adding to that are motorcycle stories. Okay. I also have some uh, young Annas in college and early marriage stories that I've put together in a, in a little piece, you know, of, mm -hmm. of uh, a little packet, so to speak. Um, probably when I get all of this together, it'll be in sections and it may be um, a section on motorcycles, a section on the young light, a section on my teaching career, those kinds of things. And for my kids and grandkids, I will just leave those, you know, probably all intact. Mm -hmm. If I plan to publish something, though, uh, I probably just take just a, a little a little section. Yeah. And. So how do you decide what part to write and what part to leave out? Well, first of all, you have to decide what it is you want to share. And because you write a memoir, you don't have to share everything. And, you and you know, sometimes people are kind of squeamish about starting because they feel like, oh, I don't want to tell my whole story. Well, you don't have to tell your whole story. You just, you know, say, what am I willing to share? What did I have passion about? Um, what really made a difference in my life. And because those are the kinds of stories that are going to be more animated and exciting to you and therefore exciting to your reader. Because we always have to keep our reader in mind as well. You know, right. we don't want to and bore that, the reader. <laughs> exactly. And that's why, you know, this new designation, I don't know how new it is now, but creative nonfiction and memoir is part of that. So, Creative, yes, because you use some of the same devices as you do in fiction writing and in poetry in the in the prose piece, in the memoir piece. So if you're excited about it, your reader's going to be excited about it because you're going to put it out there in an exciting way. Right. Now, what about people with a challenging past and maybe they want to include something um... Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they, they maybe like they survived abuse or a bad marriage or something like that. 
So would they write it out? Would they use real names? Could they? Well, okay. First of all, I'm going to start out by saying what Anne Lamott said. If people had not wanted me to write bad things about them, they should have been nicer to me. <laughs> 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 but um, folks have to decide that on their own. Um, and, you know, one thing that's a really good technique is to write it all. Just write it all and sort of get it out of your system and onto the page or onto the screen. Then you can decide what is it that I want to share and what is just too personal or too hurtful or what might hurt someone else if I share it. Um, so you make that decision. Sometimes it's hard to even get it down on paper because it's still either fresh or it's still hurtful. So one of the things I usually recommend to folks is they started out writing it in the third person. So instead of saying I was abused or this happened to me, give the character, give the person a name and use that person's name and you or that name and use she or he or they or how whatever pronouns you need to use. but anything other than the uh, personal pronoun of I. Mm -hmm. And that puts some distance between the writer and the events that happened because it's like, it's some about someone else. So that's one suggestion for being able to get it down. As far as using the person's, the other people's real names, you, you know, you have to decide that. If it what you say is going to be really health hurtful to someone, you might want to you might want to stop and think about that. Some folks check with uh, other folks, other people that they use in their stories, and say, you know, do you approve this story, so to speak, you know, or is it okay with you if I publish this? And um, so that's that's one way to go about it. Mm -hmm. What about using a pen name? I mean, if you really want to write the, the dirt could, on something, using a pen name and making up all the name. You could do that. You could certainly do that. You could fictionalize it. You know, uh, if you if you decide you want, the, if the story needs to be told, but you can't justify telling it exactly as it happened, um, then you might consider fictionalizing it. So it, you change the names, you maybe add a few things in, change the setting. Um, maybe but, females or males, males or, you know, something like that. It, it, that's possible too, sure. Right. Sure. Hmm. And so you teach, you teach a senior adults mm -hmm. um, memoir classes. Uh, so the question is, is when is the best time to write your novel? I mean, I mean, not novel, sorry, your memoir. When it, it, is it a young person? Would you, do you really need to be in your eighties to write a memoir? You, know? you don't need to be in your eighties. I've had, I say senior adults because I started out teaching, uh, adults memoir writing in an Ollie class out of Cal State Bakersfield, uh, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And, um, and senior adults are the ones who go to that class. Mm -hmm. So I've had people as young as in, in their 30s and 40s take the classes that I've offered independently. And that's fine, too. Some people may say, well, they haven't lived long enough to have any really young. But everybody has their experiences. Even right. a person who has uh, is only in their 30s or 40s you know, has had a life up until then. They had a teenage life that was wonderful or horrible or, you know, crazy or whatever. They've had, maybe they've, are in their, already on their second career. They may have had college or military service or something that they can write about. And just because you write um, memoir pieces doesn't mean it has to turn out to a finished book. Because whatever you write those who read it later on, your kids, your grandkids, your other part, members of your family, they're going to appreciate just getting a story from you. So you don't have to think of it as a long haul or I'm going to have to write a book. You know, it's going to be 200, 300 pages. It could be just a few stories, five stories, 10 stories about things that happened in your life. 
I'm an avid journaler. I've journaled, well, I started with the diary, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was 10 or something yep. and, or younger. Right? And then went to journaling and I've journaled now at least since 2014, 2015. I've even mm -hmm. found some of mine from 2020. I mean, sorry, um, not 2020, way back, uh, mm -hmm. 2002. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so a person that journals, do you feel like they have a, a an advantage because then they can go back through? Yes, that is an advantage. You can you can go back through. <laughs> um, you know, Julia Cameron uh, of the Artist Way, she mm -hmm. advocates writing the morning pages, uh, three pages a day at least. And so uh, but she says, don't read them right away. But. Uh, when you go back later on, after some time and distance, then you find a lot of stuff uncovered that you didn't really remember or, you know, in a way you thought in a way that you didn't know now that you thought that way. And you can go back and mine those journals for uh, the bigger stories uh, or more complete stories to um, include as memoir pieces. Absolutely. What and what's interesting, too, is it's your perspective. I know a friend and I were talking about um, uh, just something. That we were talking about an old memory. And I had journaled about it, well, written in my diary. And she had written in hers. And how it was so completely different, our memories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, of the um, same incident? Of the same incident. Yes, yes. yes. Right. And that's why you you don't and if you don't want to listen to it or do anything with it, you don't really ask other people like mm -hmm. your brothers and sisters yeah. uh, <laughs> or cousins who were there at the time. You know, everybody has their their different perception and experience, even with the same people or uh, at the same incident. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when when I include stories about my my brother and me, I'm I'm telling it from my point of view. Right. And we I had a, I'd written a story about my sister and when my sister was born and how you know back in the fifties nobody told kids anything, and so we it was a surprise to us that we were getting a baby sister <laughs> and that I thought that you know our grandparents had picked us up because of my birthday because it's the end of July and sister was born for early August. My brother thought it was the 4th of July and, <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't have any, any clue that it was my birthday or anything like that. You know, so yeah. we had a different perception of the time uh, frame for the same incident that happened. And, and different ages too. When I look back at my diary and it was like one of my parents' birthday and it was like nothing about their birthday at all, just about me going to the mall. And I'm like, how could I not even mention it was their birthday? But, you know, when you're 14, it's more important to go to the mall with a friend or something. So, Absolutely. It's all you know, about you. <laughs> boy, it sure is. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, Janice, um, I've asked her if she would like to read an excerpt from one of her books. So she is going to thrill us right now. With well, I don't know about, I don't know about that, Joan, but I do want to show that um, you don't have to think about it being a really long piece. This is a piece okay. about 400 words. And um, let's see, let me bring it up here. It's about 400 words and uh, it's, um, it's, well, I like it. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Here we go. It's called Lost in Plain Sight. Lured by wartime jobs and the wish for a bright future, my parents, Thomas and Ruth Cassells, landed in Detroit in 1943 in the middle of World War II. Four of dad's siblings had already moved there. Work was easy to find as Detroit was a bustling city during wartime with the automotive factories running around the clock shifts and the population explosion of Southern immigrants. Dad became a streetcar driver for the city. Mom stayed home in the tiny place they'd rented and often on dad's shift, she rode the trolley on the sideways seat right behind him. Early in July, 1943, the infamous race riots occurred in Detroit, Michigan. Just a few weeks later, I decided to appear on the planet, a round-faced seven-pounder with deep brown eyes and dark hair that framed my face like a pixie's. Mom was admitted to Wayne Diagnostic Hospital. 
Segregation was a fact of life in Detroit at the time, even in the hospital nursery. My mother was fair-skinned and so was I, which is probably the reason some nurse or aide placed me in the section of the nursery reserved for the white babies. My mother didn't know this because in those days, women who delivered babies were required to stay in bed for nine days. No walking to the nursery window to see their little ones when visitors came. Years later, she'd say, nine days. And I was as dizzy as a fool when they finally let me stand up. When my tall, handsome, brown-skinned father came to see me in the nursery the first time, he was shown to the window where a nurse greeted him and asked his name. He took she took off to fetch me from the colored section, but I was not there. I can imagine the panic when she couldn't locate the Cassell's baby. And I can imagine my dad's deep voice becoming animated and loud. What? You mean to tell me you've lost my child? I can hear the nurse's voice saying something like, just a minute, sir. She can't be lost. The nurses scurried around, checked in mom's room in case I might be nursing, then back to the nursery to examine each colored baby's wrist. Finally, someone rushed to the opposite side of the room to check in the white section. And there she found me, sleeping peacefully, already breaking the color barrier. My destiny set in motion from the get-go. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank it's you. It's so descriptive. I mean... You know, you just, you can picture it and you can picture your father and nine days. My goodness. That's I know. I know. <laughs> so, now it's like six hours. You're out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I want to, if you don't mind, Joan, I'm ready to talk about a few things, tips about memoir writing and we please can use do. that piece. Yeah, please okay. do. So um, starting, uh, starting out with, uh, not giving a whole lot of background, but enough background to set the context and placing uh, the memoir in myself in the context of history. What was going on? It was 1943, the war, the war was going on, segregation was still going on, the so on and so forth. So uh, placing yourself in the context of history it illuminates things for the reader and also just, uh, you know, sets the scene. So that's an important, an important part. Using some dialogue is really good in the, in a memoir because it helps move the story. And it also reveals something about the characters when you use dialogue, just like we know in, in fiction writing, it's the same thing, same kind of device. And um, this is only a 400 word piece. It doesn't have to be long. I'm gonna attach that piece to something else about my childhood. And you know, then I'll have a little section about uh, Anna's growing up kind of section. So you don't have to worry about that so much as um, you know, and thinking of it having to be long. And I know the first question or one of the questions somebody is going to probably ask is, but wait a minute, you were a baby. You had no idea what he said. So That's right. So you notice I said, I can imagine my father saying, mm -hmm. and I can almost hear the nurse saying so on and so forth. And that is perfectly fine in a memoir. We, everybody knows we can't know exactly what was said or, or, uh, or how people felt, we can only imagine at this point. And that's the so, creative nonfiction part. Where, that's the creative nonfiction part, yes. Right. Where it is nonfiction, that's, but you are being creative about putting things together. You don't know if somebody was wearing a blue dress, but you're gonna just say that was a yes. popular color or something. That Exactly. So you, um, you give it as much of the um, time period as you can, even though you weren't there necessarily, or or even if you were there and were old enough, if you don't really recall. Uh, for example, you know how people in your life sound. I can remember my grandmother's voice. So in the story that I wrote about the time I locked her in the basement, I was only four years old. And I don't, I remember the incident, but I don't know remember exactly what Nana said. 
<laughs> but I know her and I know her voice. And so I can imagine what she might have said because of other things that she said that I remember. So, right. yeah. That's, that's very, that's very good. Um, mm -hmm. So just, just to kind of move a little bit away from memoir, I do want to take a talk about the other uh, books that you have published. So, because uh -huh. you're an amazing poet. And so you published this in uh, 2019, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you want to tell us anything about it? Well, a lot of these poems are what I call poem was, like they are my life stories, but in poetic form. And so um, you can uh, know some things about me in, in so far as that's concerned. But the thing about poetry is you don't assume that the poems are autobiographical or memoir. You don't assume that because the speaker, sometimes uh, the those are called persona poems that you uh, assume the persona of another speaker and you mm -hmm. write the poem. So I have a poem in there called Late to Madrid and I've written it in the first person. It's not my story. It's a story that someone told me, but I wrote it in the first person. And I have had people say to me, did you ever get to Madrid? <laughs> so that tells me the poem struck them, which is right. what a poet or a writer wants. Right. Yeah. Now let's talk about this one. This was the anthology. This is huge. Yes. yes. Um, right after the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. a friend uh, gathered a group of us and said, we got to do something about this. So he and other people went to the places where there were uh, protest marches going on and demonstrations going on. And they took hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos. And so he brought those photos back, put them together in a, in a huge file by according to place, Washington, D.C., Houston, Minneapolis, New York City, Portland. And we poets um, went through the photos and looked and found photos that would inspire us to write either prose or poetry. And I have seven poems in that anthology. Okay. And our hope was to illuminate what happened and also um, start dialogue among people and understanding and be able to have conversations about the Black Lives Matter movement and other things that are going on in our social uh, milieu here in the United States and across the world, actually. You know, right. so, you and know. that was published in 2020, I think. That was published in 2020. The um, Ron Montgomery was the originator of this idea and the project manager and the whip cracker. <laughs> and we had that, he had that poem, that book out in about 140 days. Yeah, it was pretty quick. I remember you said something about it being, and then it was like, whoa, it's here. And it's, it's yes. a, it's a very nice size. Um, it's, 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 um, it's a great book. It yeah. really is a great book. The photo, the photography is outstanding yeah. and there's lots of photography in there. There's, and there's um, color photography. It's, oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. yes. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. And um, I'm really proud of it. Um, the most of the poets in uh, who contributed don't know each other mm -hmm. or didn't know each other until we started meeting online. Um, Anka Hodenpile from Writers of Kern, my friend from Bakersfield, is one of the poets who uh, also has contributed to the book. Uh, but anyway, it was it was quite an adventure, and we've enjoyed taking it on the road, so to speak, uh, performing some of the poems and conducting conversations, which is what we wanted to do um, um, for, a, for places like the African American Museum in, um, in Oakland, for Penn State Health in, Pens in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We've presented a couple times at their inclus inclusion weekend, week conferences. So lots of good things have come from it. That's good. And in the um, in the description, I'm going to have uh, links to Annis's website, her social media, which uh, I think is Instagram and uh, Facebook. 
And um, but on in her web on her website, you'll see that there's there's a place for books and all the other things that she does. So you can find out how to get get copies of her books. So one last question. Um, mm -hmm. Getting back to memoir, what advice would you give to folks that say, I, I've got to write my memoir. I got to write something down for, you know, posterity or whatever. What, what would you, advice would you give? I'd say start writing. Don't worry about, <laughs> don't worry about how it sounds. Just get it on the page or on the screen, whatever feels most comfortable for you to write. Um, usually I prefer to start by hand. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something about that hand motion and the ideas coming. But um, some people prefer using their computers to start. So whatever, that's that's the way it goes. And be yourself. Talk the way, write the way you talk, because um, that helps keep your own personal flavor and it reflects who you are. And the people who think about your audience, who do you want to read this memoir? You're your family? Um, are you going to publish it for the wide, uh, wide audience? But for the people who know you, when you write it the way you speak and they can hear your voice, that humanizes the words on the page and um, lets them recognize you. And you know, also you want to make it more than a recitation of events or an itinerary. So you want to include your feelings and your opinions, because sometimes um, talk about your relationships with other people, be because sometimes folks read your memoir and they see how you've handled the situation in your life, and they can say, "Wow, I've had that situation too. I'm not alone." Oh, this is how they handled that situation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try some of the things they tried. Or oh, hell no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Joan. Okay. <laughs> oh no, oh no, I'm not going to do the what they Sorry. did, you know, kind of thing. So either way, <laughs> but it's um, good though because people can see that they're not the only ones, and I think people identify with that. I mean, I've read a lot of memoir. And I, I imagine that would be another suggestion of yours is to read memoir, read and see how other people have done it. You know, absolutely, absolutely, it's it, that's essential. So um, every day or once a week or so, the New York Times puts out uh, a list of the best non bestsellers nonfiction, and that includes a lot of memoirs. Sometimes, right now, Viola Davis's book is on there. Um, Let's see, Matthew McConaughey's book is on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Glennon Doyle's Untamed is still on the list. It's been on the list for a long time. Um, look at Michelle Obama's memoir, uh, Becoming. That was so popular and lots of folks read that. So mm -hmm. they can get a flavor of Michelle and things that she did and thought and felt as she was coming along. So right. yes. It's really important to go ahead and read other people, people that you're interested in, people that you admire, um, maybe people who are in some way different than you. Because uh, through reading about these different people, or people have different ideas or upbringing, uh, for example, educated, I can't remember the author, but that book of um, this young woman who was in Utah and she got and she educated herself. Um, that's been a real popular one. So we can find out things about the culture that those folks grew up in, as well as about how they wrote their memoir and things that we might want to include or not include. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've always known that, or I've always been taught that whatever you write in, you need to be reading, you know? Yes. So, yes, and, absolutely. And, then, and because you want to, you're not going to copy, but it gives you kind of a, a track to run on, you know? Right. Plus it gives you an idea of, I'd kind of like to write mine this way, but maybe end it this way. And, mm -hmm. you know, so. mm -hmm. Exactly. I have a couple more things that I think are kind of important for sure. folks, Joan, if you have time. Sure. Yep. Uh, you don't have to write it all from memory, you know? You can look at old photos. You can look at old documents. You can play songs that you were the soundtrack of your lifetime that trigger recollections. You know, look at old movies. And if you um, 
you know, you might go to reunions and talk to people and, and remember things that you hadn't remembered before. And if you do, write it down. And you, you also want to tell the truth to the best of your recollection. Um, and even though, as we said earlier, your memories may differ from the memories of others who were in the same situation, but they, the, the, what you're writing is yours. So you don't have to worry about that too much. And you don't have to tell it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what some people want to do is I have to tell it every bit from, you know, the second right. I was, yeah. But no. You don't have to tell the whole story. And even in a, in a small collection, uh, uh, you know, or snippet stories, you don't have to tell the whole story. Um, because there might be parts of it that, you know, are just too too much to tell or too personal to tell or hurtful. And so you can decide, but again, if you write it all down, you can decide what to cut out. Right. Well, thank you, Annis. I really appreciate it. Um, I know you've given a lot of good tips and, you know, if people want to get a hold of you or have other questions, we're going to have your links in there. And, okay. Um, and, and also, you know, if, if you want to make comments on this video, um, both Annis and I will be watching it. And so we'll respond and um, we'd appreciate that. Well, Joan, I've enjoyed this so much. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I could talk about this forever. So it's a good thing we have a time limit. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Got to have the time limit there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, dear. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Annis. All righty. Bye bye. Bye. Um, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the upcoming interviews and until next time.